Greetings, children. Welcome back. Today we are going to do something a little different as we continue to talk about Rome and now the beginning of the fall of the Roman Republic. I like teaching ancient and medieval history. And one of the reasons I really enjoy doing so, many, many reasons, but one of them is I get to steer clear of the festering cesspool that, um, sorry, I got a visitor who wanted to come help here today. One of the, one of the reasons is I get to steer clear of the cesspool that is modern day American politics. And ancient and medieval history gives you that wide berth. But if you study the fall of the Roman Republic, if you can't see some similarities between some of the challenges that our Republic is facing now, you have to be wearing some pretty tight fitting blinders. Now, before I go any further, I wanna acknowledge the danger of what we're about to do, to try to make a comparison between a Republic that fell roughly 2000 years ago to the so-called last superpower that exists in, on basically a different planet in the 21st century. There is an instinct in history to try to force comparisons, to try to force lessons. And ancient and medieval writers always did this. We have a story of how Rome fell, but the historians of the age wanted to tell their own version of the story. They wanted to, they wanted to throw morals into the mix that may or may not have been there. I mean, think about today. We fundamentally have different groups of Americans who can't agree on the reality we're living in right now, who fundamentally believe things like the election or the pandemic or global warming or a number of different issues. They fundamentally have different versions of reality. And we're all living in the same scientific world today. And we, as Americans, see things very differently. So how differently do you think that people in Rome who recorded this history 2,000 years ago saw things. There's a danger of personal biases. I'm gonna do everything I can to throw every personal bias I have out the window. And I'm telling you right now, I'm gonna fail in that. Because as an American of the 21st century, I have certain values instilled in me. I can only see the world in a myopic way. And if I could tell you what myopic way that was, well, I could change it, but I can't because that's just how I was raised. It's the lens through which I view everything else. I'll do my best. I can't promise anything. Our world is so different from the world of the Romans. We may have, we may have instances of injustice, perhaps in our criminal justice system, but the Romans in this time period, one out of three of them was owned by another. They were slaves. We don't have anything like that. The lack of technology in that era is spellbinding. The way information is disseminated, the cultural difference. The Romans were incredibly superstitious. The Romans valued their dignitas among all else. So in so many ways, we're so different from the Romans. It's so easy to say, well, there's nothing to learn here. I'm not sure if that's true either. His first lecture back is going to be frustrating because it's going to ask more questions than give answers. But I want you to think. First of all, you have to understand where Rome was. Rome like the United States coming out of the Cold War, after it had defeated Carthage, just as like the Soviet Union had dissolved after the Cold War, Rome was the last superpower, to use a modern term, in Europe, in the Mediterranean region. They had expanded, they become wealthy, they become powerful. But not everybody gained in that wealth. Crucially, as I said, as much as 30% of the population was enslaved, and many of them were landless and jobless peasants. We talked about the problem of mass slavery on the economy. And this led to Spartacus' slave revolt, which we've mentioned before. The Romans also faced a lot of problems that might seem familiar to us today. I'm going to be quoting a lot today from Mike Duncan's The Storm Before the Storm, which talks about this era before the rise of Caesar and the fall of the Republic. Mike Duncan does a magnificent podcast series called The History of Rome. Uh, that I encourage you guys to check it out. It's not, I won't give my, my A double plus rating of hardcore history, which is my all-time favorite, but it is another great one. Let me just read a little bit of these excerpts from there. 
The first problem that uh, Cato the Elder, this Roman statesman pointed out about Rome was this. He said, quote, thieves of private property pass their lives in chains. Thieves of public property in riches and luxury. And that speaks to the idea of social stratification. In Rome, after the, after the Punic War, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. And they did it through exploitation. In our country right now, the 1% is getting richer and the middle class is getting smaller, which means the lower class, the working class is getting bigger. And some people, especially on the left, see that as exploitation. The Romans had this problem and it led to constant unrest among the population. You just saw a summer of incredible unrest in the United States. Now, while a lot of that unrest was racial in nature, that oftentimes racial issues in our country walk hand in hand with economic issues. Uh, and I think some of that spillover anger, there's definitely conjoined um, Venn diagram circles on those two. So the Romans um, would, would have dealt with these sort of pressures as well. Another thing I want to mention about Rome is this quotation from the Roman poet Sallust, and he writes, Citizens were not called good or bad according to their public conduct, because in that respect they were all equally corrupt. But those who were wealthiest and most able to inflict harm were considered good because they defended the existing state of affairs. What this quotation speaks to is massive corruption in the Roman system. Republicans and Democrats have very little in common right now. The one thing they do have in common is they don't trust their government. There is seen to be corruption that is benefiting the very wealthy, the 1%. And this cycle of corruption uh, seems to be something that has been ingrained in American society, just as it was in the Romans. Now, the Romans were far more brazen than anything that's happening in the United States in this time, but the fact that it exists is kind of scary. That's a problem. This one line I read, and this is from Mike Duncan, um, I thought it just, it just, it, it, it flew off the page at me. It said this, it was talking about um, this guy named Gaius Gracchus. Uh, someone's called the, the Gracchi brothers. And these guys were reformers. They wanted to completely change the system of Rome. They were sort of like a Bernie Sanders of the era. And they actually were both killed, beaten to death in the streets. Uh, because they were such a danger to shaking up the society, even more radical than like a Sanders would be. Um, but they, um, later in the story, the, the details of this are not important, but they, were, they, they claimed one of their sons had survived, uh, this other group who wanted to use their name to be popular, and everybody knew it was a lie. But listen to what Duncan writes. He says, um, but this was an age when a lie was not a lie, if a man had the audacity to keep asserting the lie was true. Everybody in Rome knew they were lying, that this kid was really dead, that this kid they found was an imposter. He wasn't the, the son of, of Gaius Gracchus. But if the rich, powerful people said the lie was true, then their followers just believed it. They didn't need proof. They just knew that the other side didn't want to hear it, so they kept saying it. And to me, for you guys who are growing up in this era of fake news, where Americans seem to cling to two very different sets of facts, that was just a terrifying thunderbolt to me, that the truth being under assault in Rome was something that destabilized it. There are so many other things you can look at that we can compare to Rome. One of the hot button issues was the grain dole. How much money, in this case, in the form of free food, should the government give away to the Roman people who didn't have it? A constant source of conflict. Who deserves Roman citizenship was a constant source of conflict. People wanting to get into Rome and the Romans trying to keep them out was a constant source of conflict. We'll do much more of that at the fall of the empire. There's the idea of the publicani. These government contractors who exploited the people with um, 
carte blanche of corruption. And there was this terrible factionalization. The idea that there was two groups, the populares, the, the new people who wanted reform, who wanted to change everything, who wanted to burn it down, who wanted to redo Rome, and the optimates who wanted to keep it the way it was, who wanted to keep power consolidated in the same place. And it became less about what is good for Rome, but how can I defeat the other group? That venomous sort of relationship that the left and right in America have. There were reformers like the Gracchis. There were old soldiers like a guy named Marius who would crush the norms of the Republic and try to consolidate power unto himself. But this was all, as Duncan says, the storm before the storm. The man who would finally deal the death blow to the Republic and in turn be dealt death blows himself is one of the most famous figures of all of history. His name is Gaius Julius Caesar. Let's make him our story for another day.